the GIS Certification Institute. This is a name you'll want to recognize because this is the primary professional certification institute. So uh, when I sign my <clears throat> emails with GISP at the end of it, it's because I am a certified GIS professional under the GIS Certification Institute. And among the things that this uh, Certification Institute does is provide a GIS code of ethics. And the lecture and the example that I'll be going through will elaborate on uh, what exactly is involved with uh, this code of ethics and how it's used. Um, there's also some case studies. Um, we're going to be looking particularly at one case study, again, using this uh, article from David DiBiase. <clears throat> So I have highlighted a number of elements of this article that I'm going to be speaking to. Let me clear my throat. Okay, so we are going to be looking at um, this professional ethics project and practical ethics education for GIS professionals. And uh, in this abstract, they Again, I'm highlighting things just to draw your attention towards this. I encourage you to read through the article to get a reinforcement on this on your own. Over the past 20 years, scholars, particularly those affiliated with the, GI, uh, the discipline of geography, have contributed critiques of the instrument, the instrumental nature of GIS, as well as reflective case studies that seek to demonstrate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, how this technology can be used to promote social justice, something that we spoke about earlier in the class. So in the introduction, uh, the authors talk about the emergence of uh, GIS ethics, and um, uh, Brian Hartley was at the vanguard of scholars who questioned the assumption that maps are impartial and value-neutral depictions, um, that maps do have values embedded in them, and uh, about, by the way, that's a, there's a distinction to be made because we did say that GIS or technology, geospatial technologies themselves are value neutral, but the maps, once maps are created, they're through the lens of the map maker and so they are values that are implied. About the same time, Pickles highlighted that the use of GIS as a surveillance technology, while Smith alleged that map makers and users of geospatial technology were complicit in killings associated with what he considered to be a morally questionable Gulf War. This is actually the first Gulf War that that's in reference to. So this is where we start to see this emerging GIS code of ethics, and we just talked about the GISP uh, under the Certification Institute and their GIS code of ethics. And so as GIS and T continues to, uh, to cohere, cohere as a distinct field, emerging technologies introduce increasingly worrisome ethical concerns, including location-based services such as human trafficking, something that we've talk, talked about in here. Uh, Dobson and Fisher challenge society to contemplate a new form of slavery characterized by the control of location, arguing that countless benefits of location-based services are countered by the social hazards unparalleled in human history. Again, this idea of um, <clears throat> uh, sl geo-slavery, right? That, that by tracking us, we're essentially shackled by our <clears throat> digital devices, as it were. Okay, so he goes on to describe this professional ethics project that they've undertaken, and in particular, how to teach practical, ethods, uh, practical ethics by a case method, that is a case study method. And in so doing, they outline a seven-step process that involves the following steps. First is state the problem. We'll go through an example of this. Second is check the facts. Okay, so um, there may be various uh, aspects that emerge upon viewing a particular problem uh, 
in more detail based on the facts. Okay, step three, identify relevant factors. For example, who's involved, laws, professional codes, uh, and so forth. The fourth step is to develop a list of options. Um, be imaginative, try to uh, avoid dilemma, not yes or no, but whom to go to, what to say. Okay, so a list of options that may relate to how to respond to the problem. And then test the options. And they highlight a series of tests, the harm test, the publici publicity test, the defensibility test, the reversibility test, colleague test, professional test, and organizational test. And then <clears throat> make a choice based on these first five steps, and then go back and review. So it's sort of an iterative process. All right, so let's take a look at their case study example. So the case study is related to mapping of Muslim neighborhoods. And a GIS professional employed as the director of the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events at the University of Southern California receives an inquiry from an officer of the Los Angeles Police Department. The officer is looking to for assistance in a community mapping project whose purpose is, is to lay out the geographic locations of many different Muslim uh, population groups around Los Angeles. And this goes on to say, by the way, it's interesting to note that this article, which was uh, written a few years back, a date given on this article, I want to say it's 2012 or something somewhere around there, um, <clears throat> that since this article was written, you had the bombings in San Bernardino in Southern California um, that were tied to a Muslim extremist. So you get a real world sort of context of how these things are, are unfolding. Okay, so that's kind of setting the stage. The, the LA PD wants to do this community mapping, mapping Muslim neighborhoods. Okay, um, so um, they go through and there was uh, a committee in Washington, D.C. that had looked at uh, similar projects and said this was an effective local level counterterrorism strategy, this idea of local mapping, community mapping, and maybe an example of, of uh, volunteer geographic information. Okay, however, representatives of three local Muslim groups and the ACLU expressed grave concerns about the efforts by the LAPD to map Muslim communities in Los Angeles as a part of counterterrorism. And they expressed this concern about surveillance and data gathering based on religion. Uh, so now the center at USC is faced with this dilemma. Should they undertake this or not. The project will actually support both student interns and professional staff. It will give funding. And the question is, how should the director of the center, again, the Center of Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events at the University of Southern California, how should the director respond to this request for proposal? Should they work with LAPD to execute this project or not? This is the uh, ethical case study. Okay, so the statement of the problem. Does the center's mission conflict with the universities? Will responding to the request for a proposal alienate university, the public, and more specifically the Muslim community? Could this project be considered racial profile? An important concept that I think we've talked about. Okay, so check the facts. Fact, the university prides itself on being pluralistic, welcoming, Outstanding men of every race, creed, and background, men and women. Fact, LAPD hopes to identify Muslim neighborhoods within each city's Muslim community that may be susceptible to violent ideological-based uh, extremism. Fact, representatives of three Muslim groups in the ACLU object to the mapping project as racial profiling. Fact. LAPD portrays the mapping project as a community engagement plan. Fact, 
Racial profiling, according to definition, occurs when the police routinely use race as a factor in uh, suspicion. Okay, relevant factors. Do the mission of the statements and the university conflict? Seems to be an awkward fit within the university. Is the project really profiling? The proposed project may at least be unethical and at worst illegal or unconstitutional. Is the appearance of profile damaging to the university? Which GISC rules of conduct pertain to this? Then they go through and under the sections of the GISC rules, they say, rule one, some applications may harm individuals while advancing government policies that some find morally questionable. Obligations to employers and funders. GISP will not assist a client who conducts illegal or unethical activities. Again, rules of the GISP or the GISCI, we shall allow people to know whether they are included in a database and if they're being tracked Okay, list of options. This is where we get through the harm test, the publicity test, the defensibility test, the reversibility test, the colleague test, the professional test, and the organizational test. So for example, if awarded, the results of the project may alienate the community and contribute to profiling. It could produce negative publicity. The center can defend applying as being conflicting with its uh, mission statement. In other words, can you defend it under the mission statement? Reversibility. If a member of the Muslim community, the director might have natural reservations about the focus of the project. Colleague test. How will others at the university view this? Professional test. There are conflicts with the GISP. Organization test. Ethics. Uh, the university's ethical officer may have serious reservations based on what's happening in the organization. And so they go through and they test these things for options, either submitting the pro proposal, test them for not submitting, testing for modifying the request for proposal, and so forth. Okay, and then finally, uh, review this and the option chosen was to request a modification of the RFP and respond in a manner that removes any profiling. Okay, that was sort of the conclusion that they came to. And so this just gives you an idea of the approach that can be taken.